Behavioral intentions are simply the anticipated or planned future behavior that an individual has. Here's two examples. In the next year, what would you say are your chances that you'll buy or lease a new automobile? Or another option, do you plan on buying a PlayStation 4 in the next 30 days? Yes, maybe, no, or you don't know. What's true about both of these? These are measuring someone's intentions. It's entirely possible that if your car suddenly breaks down, you might have to buy or lease a new automobile in the next year, even though you don't plan on it. In both of these cases, we're asking people to look towards the future within a certain time frame and make an approximation of the actual behavior that they'll do. We commonly measure behavioral intentions in marketing research. Surprisingly, research about the connection between intentions and actual consumer behavior shows that, generally speaking, large to moderate changes in people's intentions tends to only lead to small to moderate changes in their actual behavior. In the context of marketing, we have found that purchase intention questions tend to perform poorly as predictors of actual marketplace behavior. In other words, what people say they will do doesn't do a particularly good job of predicting what they actually will do. With that said, there is still a weak to moderate positive correlation between intention and actual behavior. A research study way back in 1989 did a wonderful job of demonstrating just how weak this connection between intention and behavior really is. This study from Jameson and Bass grabbed several hundred studies in marketing research where two things were done. First, people's purchase intentions were measured and whether or not they actually did purchase the same product was also measured. Therefore, these authors had a great understanding of how often someone's intentions mapped up to their actual purchase behaviors. Let's take a look at the dark line here, at the top part of the chart. What we see on the x-axis is the stated purchase intention that individuals had for these for these types of products. So if the person said they definitely will not buy, we would imagine that corresponds to 0% purchase probability. However, when the authors analyzed the data, they found that people who said they definitely will not buy non-durable products, on average, they actually purchased those products about 12 to 13 percent of the time. In other words, there was a mismatch between intentions and actual behavior. In addition, let's look at the top of the line here. When people said they definitely will buy a product, which we would imagine corresponds to 100 percent purchase intentions, in reality, people had actually only bought the product 42 to 43 percent of the time. Despite the generally weak correspondence between stated intentions and actual behavior, intention data still remains extremely popular in marketing research. Why is this? Well, marketing researchers are practical people. We collect data today to hopefully provide us insights that make us better in the future. The nice thing about intention data is it is forward-looking. Although it's imperfect in many ways, it is at least a direct attempt to try to measure and look into the future. Therefore, intention data remains quite popular to help inform sales forecasts, predicting future market share, estimating the performance of new products that have yet to enter the market. Satisfaction is the degree to which a product, service, or consumption experience performs relative to the consumer's expectations. Satisfaction is likely the most commonly measured construct in all of marketing research. When you look at the definitions of satisfaction, it's clear that there's two things that we need to be measuring to know a customer's actual satisfaction level. First, we need to know what their expectations were going in. Then, once they've completed that consumption experience, we need to measure their evaluative performance. However, when you look at actual satisfaction measures in the world of marketing research, it's clear that we tend to presume that consumers themselves understand what the definition of satisfaction is because we often don't measure what their expectations were heading into the experience. For example, let's take a look at the satisfaction measure at the top. How would you describe your level of satisfaction with our complaint resolution process? Very dissatisfied to very satisfied. What's clear here, though, is that at no point do we actually know what the person's expectations were heading into the complaint resolution process. Let's look at the example below where there's an attempt to measure someone's initial expectations and their evaluative performance relative to those expectations. Before you visit our brewery, how would you describe your expectations for the quality of our beer? Does the person have low expectations or extremely high expectations? After having our beer, how well did it meet your expectations? Below, met, or exceeded? Here we can see that if someone merely responded that we met expectations, we wouldn't necessarily have to be upset if, going in, they had extremely high expectations. We measure satisfaction so frequently because we make extensive use of it in marketing. Satisfaction is known to be a predictor of customer retention, market share, sales, and profitability, 
since it's a leading indicator of things that we care about as key performance indicators of marketing success, it goes, to, it goes as no surprise that we're all still interested in measuring it systematically. In addition, satisfaction data is often collected systematically in customer relationship management systems to proactively manage the efforts of service personnel. As an example, perhaps you have bought a product on Amazon recently, and a few days later after you received the product, you received an automatic invitation to provide satisfaction feedback regarding your purchase from the vendor who sold you the product. Finally, we have the type of primary data that all of the other types of primary data are trying to help us understand, consumer behavior. Behavior is simply what individuals have done or are doing. The physical activity or action that takes place under specific circumstances at a particular time and involves one or more actors. Oftentimes, we don't directly observe someone's behavior. Instead, we ask respondents to recall those behaviors and report them to us. Unfortunately, accurate memory and reporting can often be challenging for respondents. For example, research has taught us that people tend to be both inaccurate and biased in recalling when a particular event occurred. People tend to be both inaccurate and biased in recalling the number of times a particular event occurred. When we say inaccurate, we mean they are wrong. They are not accurate in they are off by some way. When we say biased, we mean that there are systematic ways in which people are wrong, whether they tend to exaggerate up, exaggerate down, guess too early, or guess too late. However, people do tend to perform better at recalling if a specific event occurred at least once, but not exactly how many times within a defined range of time. Let's look at examples of measuring behavior via recall. Look at the top one. In the last month, how many days did you purchase an alcoholic drink at a restaurant or bar? Right now, Imagine you had to answer that question as a consumer taking a survey. How would you approach answering this question? Would you be able to recall every single day in the past month, count up exactly the number of days that you were at a restaurant or bar and order an alcoholic drink? If you're not a drinker, this is probably pretty easy. If you are someone who does a drink at times, this might be very challenging. Look at this next example. Generally speaking, how many times do you work out in a week? Zero, less than once, once per week, two or three, four or five, six or more times. Notice that this type of behavior recall isn't looking for precise, accurate answers. Instead, it's looking for general patterns of behavior. Finally, in the past week, have you purposely purchased organic meat, fruits, or vegetables from a grocery store? Yes, no, I don't remember. This last example to make the recollection effort relatively easy. We're only looking back a week. We're asking people not how many times or what they bought. We're simply asking them to recall the behavior. Most people we would expect would be a little better at this task than some of the more complex recollection tasks. Unfortunately, from a marketing data quality standpoint, it's a little less useful to simply know if someone did or did not do something. We often want to know how often and how much money they've spent on doing those things as well. We often measure behaviors through direct observation as well. This is particularly true in the world of big data and in a world where so much of our activity is occurring online. Many consumer behaviors and many of those that actually precede purchase are now tracked automatically. Earlier, I mentioned that there's often bias in people's ability to recall when something actually occurred. Let me illustrate one of those biases that has been demonstrated by a number of different studies. It's called the telescoping bias. So let's take a look at this timeline here. For our purposes, all we need to imagine is that here on the far right side, this is now. And on the far left side, this is the distant past. We don't need an exact number of uh, days or to illustrate the point. And on that, let's imagine right now a survey question is asked. When was the last time you bought fast food? The, per the question is asking the person to recall exactly when it occurred. Let's imagine that in truth, the person bought fast food somewhat in the recent past here. Generally speaking, we would expect a particular bias to emerge. Even though the truth somewhat recent, we would expect that in general, there'd be a bias in people's response. It'd be an erroneous estimate of when fast food is bought. Notice how the person here is actually guessing that the last time he bought fast food is a little more in the recent past. This is called a backward telescoping bias, where things that happen in the near timeline are often biased a little further into the past. Now let's illustrate another form of the telescoping bias. Same exact survey question. When was the last time you bought fast food? Now let's imagine the truth was in the real distant past. What will likely happen is that the estimate of when this actually occurred will be erroneous. In particular, the person will likely guess that this behavior occurred much more recent than it did. This is called a forward telescoping bias. As a marketing researcher, using recall to collect 
behavioral data, we can realize how these types of biases make it very tricky to make good use of the information because of these systematic biases. As we're wrapping up our conversation about an introduction to collecting various types of primary data and marketing research, let's talk a little bit about the two broad-based forms of strategies that we use to actually collect primary data, that is communication-based and observation-based. Communication-based methods are any sort of data collection method that we may ever use where some form of communication is required on part of the respondent, the consumer, in giving that information. So if we do a one-on-one -on -one personal interview to collect that data, that's clearly communication-based. In addition, if someone takes an online anonymous survey, they still, by way of clicking on answers, are communicating with us. You can think of it as the most boring conversation you've ever had. Observation-based strategies are where we are actually observing an individual engage in a behavior. So if we were using video, uh, videotaped evidence in a retail store to watch how people behaved in that store, that would be observation-based. If we were analyzing the clickstream data of someone participating in our of someone interacting in our online store as they move towards purchase. Their clicks would be a series of behaviors. These are observation-based strategies. By looking at this wheel of typical variable categories measured in marketing research, it becomes clear that in certain situations, communication-based strategies are often superior if we want to measure that type of variable category. If we take the time to think about the fundamental differences between communication-based and observation-based strategies, some challenges emerge when it comes time to collect data for marketing research. For example, if we're interested in measuring someone's behavior, which is often the ultimate goal, so we are often very interested in actually observing what someone's doing along with anything else that we want to measure in our study, observation-based strategies tend to be the best. Observation-based strategies are actually watching that behavior actually occur. Whereas if we're using communication-based strategies, all those problems that emerge with recall biases can be problematic. On the other hand, if we want to measure those sort of things that exist strictly up in a person's mind, such as their level of satisfaction, what their intentions are, what their motivations are, beliefs, attitude, knowledge, and awareness, well, all of those things can only be directly measured if we use a communication-based method. We can't know someone's motivations without actually communicating with them. Now, there are some researchers who say you can measure motivation by looking at people's observations, but let's be clear what we're doing here. If we're using people's actual behavior to make guesses about what their underlying motivations are, what we're then doing is we're actually measuring behavior to infer motivations. If we actually want to try to tap into these ideas directly, we will have to use some sort of communication-based strategy. What's important to understand here is the fundamental conflict between communication-based research helping us measure so many of these different types of relevant marketing variables. Unfortunately, observation-based research that tracks the most important variable all, consumer behavior. This fundamental conflict where the data we ideally want is best, best collected through observation, but the, all the other types of variables that are so informative and helpful for marketing are best collected through communication-based strategies, this challenge is going to be persistent throughout most of our discussion about designing research.